We discussed our top 15 running backs on a previous episode, and now today we break down our top 15 wide receiver rankings rest of season on this episode of the Fantasy Football Fellas Podcast. Welcome in, Lucas Wenzel, Tyler Plathing, and I'll do tonight. Cameron, a little bit under the weather, he will not be joining us. And his words, he's in a mood, and it's in the one where his body absolutely <laughs> hates him. Uh, so he is taking tonight off, but Tyler and I are here to hold down the fort. Who are you most excited to talk about on today's episode, Ty? We'll give him a little bit of a sneak peek before we dive in. Who are you most excited to talk about tonight? Honestly, it's kind of the preseason studs, Jefferson Ooh. Jefferson, Jamar Chase, because vastly different situations now, but you know the talent. So are the rankings that we have them at justified? Are they a little high, a little low? I, I I, can't wait to dig into it. It is incredibly difficult to pinpoint some of these early round studs at the wide receiver position. Now, this late into the season, which is not what you anticipated at the start of the season. We'll get to that in a bit. Before we dive in, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. If you're not subscribed on YouTube already, make sure you do that. Turn on that notification bell as well. We're dropping content literally every single day in the form of shorts, uh, eight to 12 minute YouTube videos two podcasts a week as well. We're having a blast over here. So make sure you don't miss out on any of that content. Uh, you can follow us on the socials as well. FF fellows on Twitter, the FF fellows on Instagram, fantasy football fellows on Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. Bless you, Ty. I know it was off, you. but you're, <laughs> you're very welcome. I'm mostly <laughs> buying time because I forgot to set up the, the sound transition on the way in, but I've got it set now, Ty, let's dive on in to our top, rest of season, top 15 wide receiver rankings if anyone ever tells you that you're a bad host because you don't have your transition music set up tell them that they're wrong because you are because you are the best even if you don't have the transition music ready to go that was so nice of you you didn't have to say that that was so nice of you you're in a good mood tonight aren't you i yeah yeah he had he had his honey hose He's thriving. No, I didn't have my honey hose. I had my cinnamon toast crunch. S tier cereal. Was, and that it might be in a tier of its own, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, it's S tier by itself. That's it. It's S tier yeah, by true. itself. Uh, <laughs> it's, tank, it's top two and it ain't two. <laughs> it's top two and it ain't two. Uh, tank Dell isn't necessarily in an S tier, but uh, at one point he was in the Houston Texans offense. You like that transition? That was a crappy transition. Uh, <laughs> Tank Dell is our wide receiver 15, though, rest of season. Uh, he's my wide receiver 16, Cam's 15. He's all the way up at 11 for you. Heck yeah, he is. <laughs> I mean, he's been, I mean, it, look, he's been dominating since week nine. The wide receiver three, 20 fantasy points per game during that stretch. He's first in total air yards. This is that's during that stretch, correct? Like not correct. on the season. Yep. Okay. I was gonna say, I'm like, holy crap! If that's on the season, that <laughs> that's like, I feel like I would have seen that tweeted by like <laughs> Ian Harditz or something like that. Anyways, uh, yeah, right. first in total air yards, 11th in target share, 11th in air yard share during that stretch. You look at his rest of season schedule. All right, it's Denver, it's the Jets, Tennessee, Cleveland, Tennessee, Indianapolis. I mean, Denver. Jets and Cleveland, those are those are fairly brutal. I mean, you like Tennessee, Tennessee, Indianapolis, but Indianapolis is in week 18. Is Tank Dell the sneaky like playoff hero this year? Because I like, I really want to think he's this year's Amon Ross St. Brown. When I look at guys, it's just like, you know what? They really turned it on around that like 9, 10, week 9, 10, 11 range, and just went on an absolute tear. The problem is. When you look at Amon Ross' schedule that year, oh my gosh, that schedule was a green bean. You couldn't have gotten more green than that schedule for how favorable his matchups were. And that's just not the case for Tank Dell. So what gives you so much confidence to have him as your wide receiver 11 in this like really sneaky playoff hero this year? It's really just that this team is so reliant on their passing attack. Like Devin Singletary has emerged as the lead guy in that backfield, but they still like can't get enough done on the ground. So there's plenty of work going around for the, you know, for Texans wide receivers, like Nico Collins had his kind of moment at the beginning of the season, but now I've it's tank Dell. That's really kind of emerged as the go-to playmaker for this team. And 
yeah, I mean, you look at the matchups, Denver, the Jets, Cleveland, like those are three pretty tough matchups. But in some weird way, I feel like the Texans at least have a shot in all of those games. Like they can still win all of those games. I know like we all we care about is or, you know, what we should care about is fantasy points and performances and stuff. But if the Texans keep winning or keep playing like they have been, Tank Dell is going to keep getting used or he's going to keep getting utilized like he has been the last couple of weeks. And that gives me optimism, even with the tough matchups. Yeah, you talk about a puncher's chance in those games and they have a puncher's chance if CJ Stroud keeps playing at the level that he's been playing at. And if CJ Stroud continues to play at the level he's been playing at, that bodes so well for Tank Dell. Now, you might worry about Noah Brown coming back, who was on an absolute tear during that, you know, the, the two weeks before he was injured. You have Robert Woods back who hasn't really made much of an impact. Dalton Schultz, he's kind of fizzled away now as well. It's kind of been like a rotating carousel in this wide receiver room of who's available and who isn't. But it seems like Tank Dell now has kind of stepped up and made his case as to why he's the wide receiver one here. And I think the only reason why I keep him out of my top 15 and closer to 15 than 10 is just, I, I just can't get past Denver. Tennessee or Denver, the Jets, like Cleveland. I just, those are three of the toughest matchups you can have to close out the season. Denver, you know, they, they've been really, really tough recently. I know they're not like stellar like the Jets or Cleveland, but that's still not a matchup that I'm excited for. But also, again, they have a puncher's chance with CJ Stroud. All Tank has to, if, if Tank continues to get this, you know, nine, 10 target total. Yeah, I mean, there's a chance he does finish closer to 10 because he has been absolutely dominant since week nine, as you pointed out. Let's move on to to number 14. DJ Moore comes in as our wide receiver 14 rest of season. He's a wide receiver seven on the year in PPR formats. So I like as I say that, it already feels like we're too low on DJ Moore. He's very clearly Justin Fields' number one guy. There's there's really no two ways about it. Since week four, there's only two games where he's had less than eight targets. And let's not forget, Tyson Bajant was playing in a handful of those games as well. Uh, and he was also the wide receiver four during that stretch as well. So, look, are we actually too low on DJ Moore? Because I'm really starting to wonder if I should have him closer to 10 than 15. Obviously, the week 13 bye. You like the matchup with Detroit. You don't like the matchup with Cleveland, Arizona, then Atlanta, Green Bay. So again, not as stingy as Tank Dell's schedule, but more unfavorable matchups and favorable matchups in there. Is DJ Moore kind of this just like target hog, forget about it, he'll be fine? Or should we feel justified in having him closer to 15 than 10? So I think the first thing right away, right, you see wide receiver seven and you're like, Okay, we're probably a little too low. That is because the Bears haven't had a bye week and they get it in week 13. So everything kind of balances out after the Bears come back from their bye week, I think. The second thing is that I just look at the guys ahead and I know and I'm looking at their schedules and their situations and I'm like, see, I kind of like DJ Moore's a little bit more. So maybe that's kind of right. I I know. I know for me, I have DJ Moore ahead of the next two. So I am, I'm that is clear in this. I I didn't even read off the rankings. Well, I have him at 14 cam has him at 13. Ty, you also have him at 14. So we're all in this 14 range, but yeah, when you look at the next two guys, you do indeed have DJ Moore ahead of the next two guys. Sorry. Continue. I just wanted to, that's good to clarify that. I, I, I just think the old, the, the, the biggest point, I guess for DJ Moore is that it, it feels gross because it's the Chicago bears. Right. Like, right. yes, he has played considerably better or performed considerably better with Justin Fields than he has with Tyson Bajant. But you just think Chicago Bears, you know, like how good can that really be? Right. And I think I, I want to ask you this, just what is Chicago playing for with these remaining games? Like dignity. Right. Like, <laughs> I, like honestly, <laughs> Well, because it, I mean, the the you know their pick isn't going to be the number one overall pick. It's going to be Carolina, who right. ends up with the worst record, and that's their pick. So they can really just kind of play it free, I guess. Like you know, they're playing with house money at this point. Like, yeah. why not just go out and 
ball out, right? And so with that mentality also kind of makes me think like even 14 is probably too low for me. I I think that's where I'm landing. I mean, on so on the season, DJ Moore's the wide receiver 10 of fantasy points per game, 17 points per game. Just really depends on that Cleveland and Atlanta matchup, really. And even Green Bay. But if we're only playing through week 17 again, I, I do think that buy kind of balances it out. I think we do see a little bit of, of regression to where DJ Moore should actually be. But at the same time, yeah, I, I'm just really wondering if if 14 is is too low, especially as I as I look at you know, some of these other guys ahead of him. I think I, I think I do have him too low at 14. I would need to go back and retweak this if we release this, you know, now rest of season to the people. We made the we did these rankings what like last week. And so now we're bringing them in. I think we have to tweak them a little bit, but oh, yeah. I digress. Let's move on to the wide receiver 13 rest of season. Mike Evans of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers comes in at 13. I have him at 13. Cameron at 12. Ty, you're at 15. And I think I know why you're at 15 because he gets Carolina, Atlanta, Green Bay, Jacksonville, New Orleans, Carolina again. The only matchup you even really somewhat like in that stretch is Jacksonville. And even then, like Jacksonville has kind of been hit or miss against wide receivers this year. On the season, though, Mike Evans is the wide receiver nine. He he may end up being one of the best values of drafts this year. He caught it. He's caught a touchdown in every game but two. He only has three finishes outside of the top twenty four wide receivers. But you you just look at that schedule and it's so tough. So how likely is it that Mike Evans can actually overcome this daunting schedule and and beat out you know a top fifteen wide receiver ranking? Because I I again I look at that and part of me is like you know what. Screw it. If Mike Evans scores a touchdown, he's going to be top 15 rest of the season. No questions asked. That's how Mike Evans has been. But, man, this stretch of matchups with Carolina, Atlanta, Green Bay, Jacksonville, New Orleans, and Carolina again is just absolutely less than ideal and not what you really want from you know a stud wide receiver rest of season. <laughs> Mike Evans feels like the prototypical, like, you're going to play him but you don't want to watch the game and you're just going to take whatever the stat line is at the end of the game. Yeah, right. Because like, I'm just looking at like receiving yards, 66, 171, 60, 40, 49, 82, 39, 87, 143, 43, 70, no consistency there. Receptions, right. zero consistency, but I should say consistency, but on the lower end than you would hope for, it's like six, six, five, three, four, six. Like it's, three to six, but yep. he's still getting like, he, he'll, he'll have games where he gets like 11 targets, 12 targets. So you're like, do I really want to bank on that? And I think what <laughs> it comes down to, like, does he continue scoring touchdowns? Right. Cause if the work isn't, isn't super consistent, the thing that's been keeping him afloat is then the touchdown. So does he right. find the end zone in these games? I have a tough time believing that he will. And I think maybe part, I know that Baker has done okay this year. It, these are tough matchups, even for Baker Mayfield. So I, I don't have a ton of faith in Mike Evans. You still play him. I still will play him because I have him in right. a couple leagues. You're well, you I still to. am going. Yeah, you have, been to. So you have good. to. Right. It's just you, you, it's one of those, like you wish it was a little more uh, secure than, right. than it really is. Yeah, I mean, you look at games where he's had l less than eight targets. I mean, week four, he left early against New Orleans, but only three targets in that game, the wide receiver 54. In week eight, he had six targets. Only three of them, he finished as the wide receiver 33 that week. Week nine, he only had five targets. He finished as the wide receiver 21. And ironically enough, uh, in week eight against Buffalo, his saving grace was a touchdown. He didn't even catch a touchdown in week nine, but he went four for 87 in that game. So like the touchdowns are what's giving him this boost into being, you know, this top 12 wide receiver. But I, I think you're right. Like if he's not catching touchdowns during this final stretch of the season, like we might be shocked and say, you know what? Actually, Mike Evans, it's kind of crazy. That we had him top 15. Maybe he should have been closer to 17, 18, 19. But at the same time, when he finishes top 10, guess who's not going to be surprised? Nobody. No, nobody's gonna be surprised by that. So 
I think you're right. I think I think he does kind of stay afloat with these touchdowns, but it feels like kind of the same old, same old with Mike Evans. When you question the touchdowns, when you question if he can have another 1,000-yard season, he just comes out and does it again. And at this point, I'm not going to play games with Mike Evans. You're still going to fire him up, but I think it is important to know that playoff schedule, man, Carolina, Atlanta, Green Bay, Jacksonville, New Orleans, Carolina, that is not an easy stretch of games for him to take advantage of. Let's move on to our wide receiver 12 rest of season. I think I need to do some tweaking on this guy. Devontae Adams comes in at number 12. I think I drank some of the Cameron juice. I don't know what juice Cameron drinks, but I think I'm a little too optimistic because Cameron has him at wide receiver 10. I also have him at wide receiver 10. Ty, you have him at wide receiver 16. A buy in week 13, Minnesota. The Chargers, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Denver to wrap out the season. Uh, it's been disastrous since Aiden O'Connell has, has taken over. Wide receiver 45, wide receiver 21, wide receiver 8, and a wide receiver 32. He still has two games with 13 targets, though. But really, the story of Devontae Adams this year is people were like, ah, it's Devontae, he's going to be fine. But I don't know, man. I think he's really missing Derek Carr right now as much as we like to rip on Derek Carr because he's been 80 First in catchable target rate this year, despite being first in red zone targets, first in air yards, second in targets per route run, and fourth in target share. So the really, Ty, the only question we need to ask about Devontae Adams is can he overcome this atrocious quarterback play? Or how silly will Cameron and I actually look for having him top 10? And, and, and I am openly admitting right now, I am too high on Devontae Adams. I would need to go back and do some tweaking on this. I hate to hammer you on the head for this. No, one, you, no I, hammer you know, me I, on the head because, <laughs> because I, I look at this and I think I, I, I don't entirely know what I was thinking. Part of me is like just holding on to this like vision of like, he's Devante. Come on, it's man. The mystique. It's the mystique. But at some point at this point, the mystique is almost gone. Like we're on, we're literally on the last crumble of it. And as soon as he puts up a dud, against Minnesota somehow, that's it. It's gone. Devontae Adams is toast rest of season. That's yeah, my fear. I, no, that's that's completely rational. Like, I feel like wide receiver 16 is too high for him. Like, Really? You even think 16 I, is too high? I think that's about right. I think 16 is too high because, I mean, he's a, I mean, based on the four games with Aiden O'Connell, he's more like a low-end wide receiver two barely flex consideration yep and just one game where he you know made the most of his targets and found the end zone like it's it's not good honestly it's not no. good and it's not what you would expect for a guy like Devonte adams i just i have zero faith zero faith and and i'm trying to remember back to the running backs pod that we did um there were two players that you were oh oh here it is Devonte Adams is my is the Saquon Barkley of wide receivers oh yeah so that, that, that is season. that is a phenomenal comparison because I was terrified to Saquon and I think I need to apply that same model to Devonte Adams I'm literally in our weekly rankings document right now making tweaks to our rest of season rankings so I can at least give an update on where I actually have these people because I think you're 100 right he is he is a Saquon Barkley the rest of the season. Continue. Yeah, like say so Saquon's, you know, Saquon was more so like schedule dependent, but then there was a little bit of, you know, uh worry when it came to usage and stuff when Tommy DeVito uh was you know named the starter for the rest of the season, pretty much. Devontae is like the inverse of that, where it's the usage and the um I shouldn't even say usage, it's the you know. He's not been able to capitalize on his usage because of the quarterbacks and he has an okay schedule the rest of the year. So like you could check the schedule box, but it's everything else about his situation that you're just like, he, he it's going to be tough for him to succeed. So just to update, I did just move him down to 15. I have him. Behind Cooper Cup, I have Cooper Cup as my wide receiver 14. I know it hasn't been looking great for him, but I have faith he would bounce back. And I have him ahead of Tank Dell yet, which also might be a mistake. 
but again, two two terrible matchups. I'm gonna just take the the, the talent of Devontae Adams there. That's that's where I'm at. But that would move that would move Devonte Adams all the way down to the wide receiver 14 in our consensus rankings, and that would move everybody else up one spot. So that goes to show my if I when I move my ranking down five spots, Devonte Adams we're, like we're talking about him at 12. You know what? He should really be down at really be down at 14 or 15. Actually, that would put him at 15. I stand corrected because that would be behind Mike Evans. I'd be behind DJ Moore, which would put him at 15 over over Tank Dell by literally like by our by our metrics 0.6 of a of a spot it's 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 bad it's bad it's bad uh i am worried if i am a Devonte adams manager and as i said really we'll, we'll talk about him at 12 but really you know if, if we had a magic wand we would just move this back to 14 and just trim everything but we're, we're, we're too far <laughs> we're too we're too far into the bit uh cam, let's can you edit this and we can't need- <laughs> edit cam can't ja- jackson jackson, jackson. Jackson, we got to bring that back. Jackson, oh, yeah. that. I think I think you think Jackson's ego gets a little big whenever we like used to do that. <laughs> like... Well, apparently, I don't think it's that big if we're not his number one. Oh, we won't. Oh, yeah. yeah what so. a what a bum. <laughs> Sorry, not, Jackson. Had to say not, something about he's it. He's not producing the NFL draft live this year. What a what a fraud. <laughs> Let's move on to wide receiver 11 rest of season. Michael Pittman Jr. I have him at 12, Cam at 11, Ty at 13. We're all right in the same range. Tennessee, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Vegas, Houston. Wow, almost got Houston, Atlanta, Vegas. Shout out Drake there at the end. Uh, look, definition of volume is king. Dude, I'm on it with the one-liners recently. <laughs> Bars. Just not, not to just <laughs> pat myself on the back. Uh, look, volume is king. Six, six, six. Uh, more games with 11 plus targets uh, than eight or fewer targets this year. So, so Michael Pittman is a target hawk. More games with 11 plus targets than eight or fewer targets this year. That's actually that's actually wild. Only five top 15 finishes on the year. Still currently the running back or the wide receiver 12, excuse me, on the season. So regardless of schedule, this is purely just a volume based ranking. The matchups don't really even matter, correct? Because what you can count out with Michael Pittman at this point is that he's probably going to see somewhere between 8 to 13 targets every single week. He's probably going to catch somewhere between 6 to 10 of them. And he'll give you somewhere between 60 to 120 yards, probably. If he scores, icing on the cake. But this is just like, close your eyes, play, excuse me, play the volume. And we don't need to talk about the matchup. This feels like... My, Michael Pittman this year feels like Chris Godwin of the last couple of years. Yeah, just straight yeah. up volume play. You're Minimal. on it with the comps tonight, man. Uh, we I got the one liners. Ties mm. on it with the comps. Oh, this is a dynamic duo. <laughs> Name a better Sorry, duo. Man. I'll wait. Yeah. Peanut butter and jelly. Let's yeah. hit it with a baseball bat. Go ahead. <laughs> I like again. Chris Godwin, pure volume play. Minimal, you know. Up, I shouldn't say upside, but you never really got like the end zone, you know, cherry on top with with him. And that's Michael Pittman this year. It doesn't right. matter what the matchup is. And now with Jonathan Taylor out for at least the next two yeah. to three weeks, maybe the rest of the season. Who knows? Why, why, why would he not get some more work? Right. I Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and I said, and I said, Pittman's my 12. He's now my 11 when I moved Devontae Adams out of my. Out He's of my actually my wide receiver one at this point. Like, yeah, I don't I, know I, why I, we. Can't... At this why point, what are we doing? doing? Yeah, what are, are we, we doubting him? <laughs> no, I mean, Michael Pittman is, I, I love the Chris Godwin comp of years past because that's exactly what Michael Pittman feels like. You play him. He's going to get the volume. The matchups are fine. You're not really nervous about any of them. Uh, Atlanta and Houston are the only ones you're you're really concerned about, and Houston is in Week 18. And if you're playing in Week 18, look, I, I don't want to call you a stooge, but at the same time, talk to your league manager and tell him not to play in Week 18 next year, because that's just got nightmare written all over it. But anyways, yeah, I mean, you look at the matchups and they're all they're all great. Uh, Atlanta is the only one you're really concerned about. So, yeah, I, I love Michael Pittman rest of season. Um, he he's by far one of my favorite plays. Um, inside of the top 15 here. I feel like that's a little biased for you to be, to say that he's one of your favorite plays because you did buy him for the cheapest price I've ever seen 
in any league when it comes to Michael Pittman. So yeah, Cameron Cameron's just having a little bit of uh, PTSD with uh, that's why absolute, he missed out on this because he knows right. he's wrong about Michael Pittman and he didn't right. want to he, talk about it. Right? He uh, yeah, strap. Right? <laughs> Smell, <laughs> smells a lot more like I fleeced you with Traylon Burks. Got that's what him. it sounds like. Got him. <laughs> yeah, the the swap was Traylon Burks and Michael Pittman with with the sort of picks in between. And oh, I think I came out. I think I came out way up on both sides. I will say I, win- I, I am one of the few people in our league who have won more trades with Cameron than I have lost. <laughs> I witnessed. This I'm just in saying, person and I was dumbfounded. I come out of the hotel on. Literally. Wait for the crowd to just like up, go up, just roar. It's like Breakfast Club, just the fist pump in the <laughs> air. Like that's literally what it was like. <laughs> oh, it was phenomenal. Uh, Ty, what do you say we took a quick break here? Uh, made it through our eleven through fifteen wide receivers. We'll come back talk about top ten wide receivers after we hear from our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. <laughs> Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. Two picks will triple your money, three will six times it, four will ten times it, and five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too, so if only four of your five props hit, you still get ten times your entry. And if you use our code FELLOWS when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. Alrighty, we are back. Went a little longer on that one. We're going to dive on into our top 10 wide receivers rest of season. Now we'll be able to clip through these guys at a little bit uh, higher of a pace. Maybe not though, because there's still some decent question marks around some of these guys inside of the top 10, but uh, let's get, let's move on to our wide receiver 10 rest of season. Brandon Ayuk. Comes in at 10. I have him at 10. Again, made that Devontae Adams tweak important. Uh, I, I have him at 10. Cam has him at 14. Ty, you have him all the way up at 8. And you just absolutely love the rest of season schedule here. It's an absolute dream. Philadelphia, Seattle, Arizona, Baltimore, Washington. Rams in Week 18. But again, we don't we don't mess with eight Week 18 matchups. Uh Really, the only one you're scared of in there, not even scared of, the only one you're like slightly hesitant on is Baltimore. Otherwise, these are great matchups coming up. The thing is, though, like you look at Brandon Ayuk, like you look at him, the wide receiver 16 on the year, wide receiver 14 in fancy points per game, but yet you look at him before the bye. Not that he didn't have a single top 20 finish in weeks five to eight. Obviously, he came out hot and just came out blazing to start the year. So, so here's what I'm going to ask. How how confident are we that Brandon Ayuk is the one to actually take advantage of this rest of season schedule? And it's not Debo Samuel. Because we didn't go through honorable mentions. Debo Samuel is an honorable mention. Because even against Seattle on Thanksgiving, Debo was the guy to take advantage. I know Brandon Ayuk still had himself a nice day, but he only had four targets on the day. It wasn't anything great. Or maybe is is the correct answer actually both? And and it's not that Brandon Ayuk is necessarily missed rank, but it's actually that Debo Samuel isn't also in here. How do you how do you balance the two? What makes you so confident that it's Brandon Ayuk at wide receiver eight? So just looking at their opponents coming up, and I definitely was spacing out because I was doing my own little research here for this argument. Oh, no, you're good. Um, you're good. Philly, Seattle, Arizona, Baltimore, Washington, and the Rams. According to PFF, four of these opponents run more man coverage than zone coverage. You take a look at the splits for the Niners between, you know, how the wide receivers do against man versus zone. Brandon Nayuk clearly is their guy in man coverage. And then it's kind of balanced in zone coverage between Ayuk, Devo, and Kittle. So 
I say that to say I don't think you know. I think it's justified to not have Debo inside the top fifteen. But if I, it, you have to lean I, at least in my opinion, you have to lean Ayuk over like as the guy to take advantage of these matchups. Not sure. just I mean from a from a you know coverage standpoint, but also from the fact that like. More times than not, Brock Purdy and Brandon Ayuk have shown more rapport with each other than him and Debo Samuel. Yeah, so so I don't so let me also clarify. I don't think we are incorrect in having Brandon Ayuk ahead of Debo. I think my my the more so the nature of that second part of my question was should Debo Samuel actually just be higher? Um, should he be higher than than where we have him outside of the top fifteen? Because I don't I don't necessarily think it's wrong to have Brandon Ayuk inside of the top ten. I mean, this this 49ers offense is high powered enough. The matchups are very clearly there. We know what Brandon Ayuk can do, and he could crack top ten in in having just three games with twenty plus fantasy points, and he could be top ten rest of season, which is totally possible with that schedule. Um, but also, I hear what you're saying about Debo Samuel, where um, you know he's not. Sorry, I'm pulling up man coverage stats for Brandon Ayuk. I want to see where he ranks in, in fantasy points um, scored against man coverage this year. But yeah, that, that oh, look at that. Brandon Ayuk uh, has scored the sixth most fantasy points this year against man coverage. So there you go, like six of all wide receivers. So yeah, if you look at coverage schemes and most of these teams are playing man, I do think I'd like Brandon Ayuk is the guy rest of season. I don't think it's a mistake that we have him at 10. Might it be a little bit that I might be closer to? 11 12 13 sure let's let's split hairs if you really want to but i guess debo is a guy i'm really curious about because i think it could be debo who slides you know into the top 15 as well and you know him and him and iuk are you know wide receiver 12 and 14 13 and 15 rest of season i feel i i feel like debo is the most volatile player in fantasy football i mean, has been this year and will continue yeah. to be down the stretch just because Yes, it's been, I mean, the last three weeks, he has gotten three and four, or he's gotten eight total rushing attempts in three games, but two of those have three and four, and he found the end zone in those two games. But only one of those games is where the receiving work also came with it. The other, he only had four receptions for 30 yards. So, like, if you're looking yeah. for, if you're looking for, you know, the guy that's going to be utilized, the, I should say utilized because that him because that would lean Debo. But yeah, um right. if you're looking for the more true receiver, that's Brandon Ayuk. And he and and he has been delivering the the most between him and Debo. So I get I can under I, I'll say it like this too. I understand an argument for Debo to be top 15. I yeah, wouldn't yeah, go yeah. as far. I n- no, I and I I think we can agree on that. I mean Brandon Ayuk is he he's been the, the the better wide receiver in terms of fantasy points per game against all these coverages. And if these teams are going to play man, I do think it's the uh, Ayuk is the way to go. It's just yeah, is ten too high? Is Debo misranked? I think it, it's a tough thing to balance out. But I don't think we're wrong for having Ayuk this high. I also think he could be a little bit lower as well. This feels ceiling ish for Brandon Ayuk. Maybe that's what I'll say. Sure, that may yeah, I could understand that. And ceiling ish being you have him at eight, and that's probably as high as I would go in terms of ranking him. Uh, let's keep it moving though, because we got we got nine other wide receivers to talk about here. Coming in at nine, Jamar Chase. Oh boy, wide receiver eight for me, wide receiver nine for Cam, wide receiver eleven for you, Ty. Gets Jacksonville, I, Indianapolis. Go for it. Why don't you pop pop in? I had him lower before we did this, and then I kind of that's what I thought. I was like, and I'll, I'll be fully transparent. I had him as my wide receiver 15 because I had no, I just have no faith in this current situation of his. But then I looked at it and I was like, wait, there's another guy on this list that is in a similar ish situation, debatably worse. Like, and he's ranked ahead by a considerable margin. So I was like, can I really dock Jamar Chase and not dock the other guy? Yeah. So that's why I, that's why I moved him up, but I still don't feel great about it. Well, I, I I mean, even at eight, I feel pretty ballsy for having him at eight because really I'm I'm just looking at volume, volume, volume. That's when I'm banking out with Jamar Chase because he has Jake Browning at quarterback the rest of the year. It is not Joe Joe Burrow. 
Uh, and the first game, like, <laughs> very, very lackluster. Uh, Cincinnati just absolutely dominated time of possession. No, Pittsburgh did. Uh, Pittsburgh did, excuse me. Yeah, uh, they, <laughs> yeah. I read it as Cincinnati had a whole quarter's worth more time of possession than Pittsburgh. But really, it was uh, less than Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh absolutely dominated time of possession in that game. Only 11 rushing attempts. Jake Browning actually spread the ball out as well. Nine different pass catchers got at least one target in that game. You know, Jamar Muster's up four for 81 on six targets. So, I, I mean, the fear is like, is wide receiver nine actually too high because it's Jake Browning? Or is Jake Browning just going to be one read, give it to Jamar, and hope for the best? But based on that target distribution, it doesn't really seem like it. Well, and T. Higgins is still injured, is he not? Yeah, he is. And he could fill fa- factor into this too. I was going to say, if he comes back, it gets even murkier for Jamar Chase then. Um, or or does it actually make things easier for, for Jake Browning? So it's not all Jamar Chase. Well, I, it, I I can understand if it's easier for Jay Browning, but then that impacts Jamar Chase's fantasy ceiling, right? Sure. Like, so I, it's it's a tough situation to expect great results from. That's what I'll, that's how I'll say it. Um, but you know, at least with Jamar Chase, there is the potential for this offense to really go just one read right to Jamar Chase. And you know that Jamar Chase can make the most of that. That's why you still have to at least, you know, acknowledge the fact that that's a possible reality. Even if you think it's unlikely, it could very well happen. It's scary. I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared to have him this high. I really am. It feels it feels tough though because it's Jamar Chase and discounting him to nine is already tough enough as it is. But oh man, yeah, it's it's scary to have him this high because I think there is a world where he does actually finish outside of the top fifteen. Um, yeah. and maybe you do just have to play situation rest of season, and Jamar is is closer to fifteen than ten. So again, like I have him at eight, and part of that is like I just have faith this offense. Is just going to say, all right, Jake Brown, and go ahead and beat us. And it's just going to be one read to, to Jamar Chase. Again, and you look at the matchups. It's really nothing overly daunting. Jacksonville, Indianapolis, Minnesota, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, or Kansas City, Cleveland, and Cleveland's in week 18. They're going to need to put up points against Kansas City. They're going to need to put up points against Jacksonville, and Indianapolis, Minnesota, and Pittsburgh are, are fine matchups for wide receivers. So it's not like it, it's bad matchups. It's, it's literally Jake Browning. Like, how much faith do you want to put in Jake Browning? Is he better than Aiden O'Connell? Yes or no? I don't think so. Does it matter? It doesn't matter. They're both bad. Well, both. I They're says the guy bad. sitting is sitting and recording a podcast that doesn't play NFL football that two quarterbacks are bad. Yeah, right. But right. <laughs> good clarification. Let's move on to wide receiver eight. This is man. This, this top ten is just like. Part of me is like, I wonder if this top 10, like these first two guys, because it feels like once we hit seven, it's pretty set. Like the seven yeah, is set. Well, everybody uh. between <laughs> everybody between Every, everybody everyone between, in the top five is set. And then it's everyone else. I I, I find it hard that I, I I still think it's seven. Basically, okay, eight through okay. fifteen. Eight through fifteen, you could honestly have them in any order, and I would probably say. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I don't you, actually you, hate that. You could put Gabe Davis in the <laughs> <laughs> get out of here. Go I'm home. Sorry. Sorry. You're drunk. <laughs> you're 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 home. Go drunk. Um, <laughs> number eight is Devonta Smith of the Philadelphia Eagles. I have him at nine, Cam at eight, Ty. You have him at ten. Uh, we have gone over this. This is a great schedule. For the Philadelphia Eagles as well. The only matchup you don't like is against Dallas in week 14. But San Francisco, Dallas, Seattle, Giants, Arizona, Giants again. It was really sketchy for Devonta Smith up to week eight, man. He had only one top 10 finish, only two top 20 finishes. He had he had more finishes outside of the top 25 wide receivers than he did inside of the top 25. But since week eight, he's been the wide receiver seven in fantasy points per game. 
Hasn't had Dallas Goddard the last two weeks. They just have a chance of returning this week now, which could just like absolutely smash all the hopes and dreams for Devonta Smith in the fantasy playoffs. I think favors AJ Brown, which we'll, we'll get to him later, obviously, but I, 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 I look, my question was, well, how do we have him? How do you have him ranked ahead of Jamar chase? But as we've gone <laughs> on in this episode, I, I keep thinking, man, maybe DJ Moore should actually be at eight. Maybe oh, Mike insane. Evans should be a little bit lower. Maybe uh, who who is the other guy we talked about that could be higher? Um, Michael who Pittman. Who am I thinking of? Michael Pittman. Yeah, maybe he should be up here. Like, or Tank Dell. Or I, uh, uh, there's a case for Tank. Like eight through fifteen is so volatile here, and I don't want like I got a few comments where yesterday people are like, "Oh, I stopped watching this video when Saquon was ahead of." Ramondre and somebody I can't remember who else it was. And I'm like, I want if you listen this. to the episode, we had these guys all over the place. I actually did have Saquon lower than consensus. This is just like grain of salt because these are like, again, this is me saying you can have these in any order. And frankly, I wouldn't bat an eye between eight through 15 because there are, can we say there are about, you know, that's seven spots. Can we say there's probably 12 guys fighting for those seven spots. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, I, cause, so. I mean, I mean, you go on the list, you have Debo, you have Chris Olave, you have Garrett Wilson. Who's been a target hog. Who else do we have? Like Calvin Ridley. He's been playing out of his mind recently. Jalen Waddle. I know it's a tough schedule, but he's been, he's been turning it up. Adam Thielen didn't make this list. So, the, so, Here's what I'll ask. Level of confidence, because we're getting a little bit sidetracked. Level of confidence in Devonta Smith rest of season to actually be a top 10 wide receiver. I'd give it like a 40, 60 chance. And 40, 40, 40 in favor, does. 60 not in favor. Yes. And it really comes down to, uh, it, it comes down to Dallas Goddard, honestly. Right. And that it sounds funny, but it's been true. It is, it's and been true. I, is it fair to say that this Philly offense still is not hitting their stride, but we're getting no. into week 13. They're so not. at what point, so at what point do we just say like, actually this is the Philadelphia Eagles offense, right? Yeah. Without Shane Steichen, they, they, they lose a step. They aren't this explosive dynamic unit as they once were. I seriously. Yeah. I, I like the 40, 60, but again, you go down the list, Brandon, I, you could be in top 10. 40, 60, mm -hmm. you go down the list, Michael Pittman, 40, 60, 35, 65. Then you Mike, start getting Devontae, like Devontae Adams, Adams I think is even less. I think Devontae Adams is like 2080. Mm, yeah. I, my, Mike Evans then 25, 75. Yep. DJ, I think DJ Moore might be back to that 50, 50. And he's that, at 14. Yeah, <laughs> Like what are we doing? I but but this is this is again. I don't mean to like detract from Devonta Smith, but this is the this is just the volatility. But in in these seven rankings that that is there, so you could have him in any order. Yeah, we all have him in a different order, but we're just pointing out the different volatilities, the different ways that guys can thrive, different ways that that, that guys could actually fall out. And Devonta Smith is kind of the capstone of that. He's like the pinnacle of that where, yeah, you know what? He could actually be top six rest of season. But there are a lot of things going against him there that could potentially keep him outside of the top 12 even. Yeah, true. Let's move on to some more solidified guys. Because again, now we get to the top seven. I feel a lot better about who's who's in this top seven. I don't think we can we can't really mix up the top seven a whole lot. Maybe you can a little bit, but again, once we get to like one through four or five, I think it's pretty set. Stefan Diggs comes in at number seven. He's wide receiver for Cam wide receiver seven for Cameron and I. He's wide receiver Cameron for seven and I. Um he's wide receiver seven for for Cameron and I. Wide receiver six for you, Ty. Gets the bye this week. Kansas City, Dallas, Chargers, New England, Miami. It's not a wonderful schedule, but I mean, you just look across the board. He's top 10 in targets, target share, receptions, receiving yards, air yards. 
you're just rarely are you disappointed with Diggs. You had like two weeks there before last week. And even last week you were scared for a little bit because he was five of six for 16 to touchdown the first half. You were fine with that, but for halftime, it was pretty scary, man. Um, but you're rarely ever disappointed with Diggs. He was averaging 21.7 fantasy points before Ken Dorsey really started shaking things up before he got out, before Joe Brady took over. So what keeps Diggs outside of this top five and barely inside of the top seven? Is it schedule? Is it still a little bit uncertainty with Joe Brady? Like what keeps him at seven and not top five? For me, at least, it feels like the top five guys are very, very solidified just because of the, you know, the situation that they're in with the schedules that they have and, you know, how they've been utilized throughout the year. And and maybe, you know, I was going to say consistent, but I'm Diggs has been fairly consistent all year except for his two down games. So it's like, can't really use that argument. But I, it, I don't know if there's really anything else I can add for Diggs because I've got like a softball of a transition for us <laughs> to the next guy. But I, yeah, I, it's just that the five other guys are solidified they are like that is the five for me and so it's like maybe best way to say it there's like three s tier guys two a tier like a yeah a tier yeah, and then right, digs right. is like a minus and then everyone else yeah. <laughs> right right which i think is completely fair so go ahead lob me your softball because i don't disagree with any of that i just think i think digs just has the most up in the air for him frankly he probably could be at six ahead of this next guy if we really wanted to debate that but we don't need to debate Diggs. We know he's top seven rest of season. He's going to be a stud. Go ahead. Give me give me my softball into, into number six. <clears throat> okay. All right. Needed a throat clearing for that. Something big. I, I can't believe you guys have this guy with his situation ahead of Diggs. I'm going to say it. And I've got them within one spot of each other, so I can't really like say that say, like, you guys right. are completely <laughs> wrong. But like... But like, I think when people hear this and you know situations and stuff, it sounds off. But the talent doesn't say so. But the situation says that it is maybe a different story. Right. So, so our wide receiver six is Justin Jefferson. He's he's wide receiver six for me. Five for Cameron. Seven for you, Ty. Uh, has a bye week. Vegas, Cincinnati, Detroit, Green Bay, Detroit to close out the season. Uh, obviously, hasn't played since week five. He's been on IR, but. Weeks one through four, he was averaging over 25 fantasy points per game, 25.8 to be exact. I get it, right? Uh, coming off slow from injury, potentially, in week 14. You don't have Kirk Cousins anymore. You got the past or not. You got Josh Dobbs, who's fresh off of a four-interception game. Did you see that Kevin O'Connell press conference today? Uh, yeah. <laughs> A little bit suspect for for Josh Dobbs. Like that was not Sean exactly... Mannion. <laughs> Lord, if, I mean, okay. So let me say this. Let me say this. If we cut. do get Nick Mullins, if we do get Jaron Hall, it, freaking a Sean Manny. I don't know who it's going to be. If it's not Josh Dobbs, oh, Justin Jefferson immediately is closer to Jamar Chase than me. For me, than he is. So so the, here here here's the reason why. Here is the reason why I have. Justin Jefferson ahead of Stefan Diggs, though. I think this Kevin O'Connell offense is designed for one thing and one thing only, and it's to get Justin Jefferson the ball in space. I I I get it that oh, Stefan Diggs, he's designed plays too. Yeah, but like was Stefan Diggs averaging 25.8 fantasy points per game while Justin Jefferson was? No, because Justin Jefferson is schemed four dynamic plays in this offense. So even though it's a downgrade at quarterback, I don't know if it's like enough for like, an, I don't know if it's enough of a downgrade from, I mean, coming off of a four interception game, maybe it is. I just don't think that's who Josh Dobbs is rest of season. And when you're looking at Josh Dobbs, the ability to create plays, like who says Justin Jefferson can't also find a hole and then help out Josh Dobbs. So I, I, again, we're, we're splitting hairs, and if you and if you're splitting hairs, wants to be he goes from Kirk Cousins to Josh Dobbs, and he should be ranked below Stefan Diggs. Fine, fine, I agree with that. 
if you're splitting hairs because he's coming off of injury in week 14, might not be full strength right away. So he should be lower than Stefan Diggs. Fine, fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I think for me, it's just the nature of this offense that he's the first read, that they're scheming plays in open space for him to take advantage of. Like Justin Jefferson is the heartbeat of this offense. I don't think that's necessarily true for Stefan Diggs and the Buffalo Bills. I, I think Josh Allen can do too much. They have James Cook. Their run game has been okay. Yeah. The Vikings don't have that. Alexander Madison has been hitting more cutbacks than I have ever seen him hit. <laughs> I've been watching him, and every time I feel like texting you, I'm like, holy crap. Did you see that cutback Alexander Madison had? Typically, he just runs straight into the butt of his offensive lineman or whoever's yeah, walking for him. But, <laughs> but he, like, for once, he hits, like, the, the, the cutback to the right. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it was the gaping hole that you never see. So I digress. I, I think the only reason why he's ahead of Diggs for me is because Justin Jefferson is the heartbeat of this offense. And once he comes back and the Vikings are fighting for a playoff spot, if Justin Jefferson isn't a big part of the offense, then Kevin O'Connell's very clearly doing something wrong. So maybe maybe it's not so much Diggs versus Jefferson. But if we're docking Jamar Chase for his situation, why are we not docking Justin Jefferson? We are because like well we are well uh, who's it, better Josh Dobbs or Jake Browning? I was going to say like the reason why Justin Jefferson is at six and Jamar Chase is at nine is because of Josh Dobbs. But yes. if Nick Mullins goes in, oh, yes, yes, then it's eight or then it's eight and nine. A hundred percent. So hundred percent. We're splitting hairs at that point too, but I think. There's a, I maybe the best way to say it is this. There's still a lot of moving pieces when it comes to this Justin Jefferson piece of the puzzle. And it's the puzzle within the puzzle. Um, sure, right. Because he, yeah, it could be six here with Dobbs. It could be lower with really Jaron Hall. Even that's still an option too. Or Nick Mullins. Um So you kind of hope that the quarterback play doesn't really matter, that the scheme is just good enough to get him open and the ball can just get there. I, It feels high. It feels high. It may not be high, but it just feels high at the moment. So if your argument for Diggs is that there's less moving pieces, there's less pieces of the puzzle within this already larger puzzle, and Diggs is the consistent thing, I get it. I hear you. You can have Diggs there. I, I want. I don't blame anybody for having Diggs ahead of Jefferson. I just think since this team is competing, and they've waited this long to bring Justin Jefferson back, they could have brought him back two weeks ago, but they've been intentionally holding him out until he's 100% healthy, giving him one more week even through the bye. I find it hard to believe he doesn't come back and just hit the ground running because they need him to if they want to make the playoffs this year. I understand Buffalo's in a similar situation, but. I just think with Josh Allen and and Gabe Davis and James Cook, like they they use so many other weapons in their offense versus the Minnesota Vikings offense is Justin Jefferson. Plain and simple. Uh, we'll keep it moving because we we've only got like six minutes to talk about five guys. Um Keenan Allen comes in at number five. It's wide receiver five for me, six for Cam, four for you, Ty. New England, Denver, Vegas, Buffalo, Denver, Kansas City to close out the out the season. He has three finishes as the overall wide receiver one on a given week. So week two, three, and 10 also has a wide receiver four, wide receiver five, wide receiver seven finish to his name as well. Four games with 14 or more targets this year. Three straight games with at least 10 receptions and 14 targets. This is like Michael Pittman is like Walmart oh, Keenan I Allen. Yeah. Right? That, that That's what it is because this is another shut up. You play Keenan Allen. He's top five because he's going to give you 12 plus targets every single week. Can we leave it at that? Like, again, I'm not yep. worried about the matchups. Like these are these guys in the top five. I'm not worried about the matchups because they are just like, shut up. They get targets. They've been phenomenal yep. this year. Play them. The only thing I would say with Keenan Allen is we told you so. <laughs> That's about it. And, and granted, it may be a little bit of luck rolled our way with Mike Williams, but even without Mike or even with Mike, I still think Keenan would probably be a, a borderline top 10 guy this year. Maybe mm -hmm. not the wide receiver, the wide receiver too, like he is right now. But I still think Keenan would have been a borderline top 10, 12 guy with how this offense has been needing him this year. 
That's it. We don't got to say anything else. We're good. Nope. Let's move on. Let's move on to another target hog. Amon Ross St. Brown is our wide receiver for rest of season. Four for me, four for Cam, five for you, Ty. You just have him and Keenan Allen flip-flopped. Uh, I frankly don't even blame you for that, considering their current on the season ranking. New Orleans, Chicago, Denver, Minnesota, Dallas, Minnesota for Amon Ross. He's been the wide receiver four since week six. Wide receiver three in fantasy points per game. He's been the wide receiver seven or better in all but two games. Is that true? I wrote this stat and I don't believe it. <laughs> that's a crazy stat if that's true. If that's actually, I, I feel like I I wrote that. I feel like I was looking at a weekly finish and I wrote wide receiver seven. I'm holding it up right now because I don't believe myself. Yeah, that that's not, uh, oh, during that stretch, excuse me. Um, since week six, that is that is a true stat. Since week six, he's been the wide receiver seven or better in all but two games. Ooh. So that that Solid. is a true stat. It's just since since week six. I'm like I'm looking at the first four weeks. I'm like there are four weeks already right there where he was not a top seven wide receiver. But <laughs> since week six, uh, week eight he was wide receiver nineteen. Week twelve he was wide receiver eighteen. So he's been a top twenty wide receiver outside of that. Um, nine plus targets in every game, but two only has one game lower than seventy receiving yards this year, which is. <laughs> which is crazy. Um, he's Mr. Consistent. It's elite consistency at that. And really the only thing holding him back is his pristine schedule rest of season, right? I mean, New Orleans, yep. tough. Denver, tough. Dallas, tough. But Chicago and two against Minnesota, I mean, he's going to eat in those games. And frankly, he'll be he'll probably be just fine against New Orleans, New Orleans, uh, Denver, and probably Dallas as well because they're going to need to throw the ball in that game. But I mean, the only thing holding him back from top three is that that pretty pristine schedule. Yeah, I mean, like you said, Mr. Consistent, Mr. Elite Consistent, doesn't matter in the matchups because he is that guy in that offense. Yeah, uh, and, we'll, and we'll keep it moving because we really don't need to spend much time you know, splitting hairs there. Number three is A.J. Brown. It's my wide receiver two. I'm flipping him in, in our next guy. AJ Brown's my wide receiver three rest of season. Um, Cam has him at three. Ty, you have him at three. So we're three across the board. Actually, these last three guys, we have one, two, three across the board in the exact order. San Francisco, Dallas, Seattle, Giants, Arizona, Giants, as we mentioned with Devonta Smith. Obviously a pristine schedule there. From weeks three to nine, he was the overall wide receiver one. He had 17 more fantasy points than wide receiver two Tyreek Hill during that stretch. He was averaging two and a half more fantasy points per game than Tyreek Hill. I mean, week, how do you describe week 11? Like drove a Ferrari at like 95 over a speed bump. That's what it feels like, right? Like, (laughs) you know, you like, you like hit one of those speed bumps in the parking lot a little too quick. And you're like, oh shoot! I think I just like jacked up my car. Yeah, right. It's just like, whoa. it was like it's like quick. You like panic for a moment, but then it's like back to normal, right? And uh-huh. I feel like you know AJ Brown is obviously not a freaking Chevy 2015 Chevy Malibu that I drive. Like he is much more of a he is much more of a you know a, a nice brand new 2022 Ferrari. Uh, and yeah, I feel like you just hit that at a speed bump, full speed. But then you're back on track week 12, right? So. I, really, it's the supporting cast that keeps him out of the top two, right? And that's like, again, this is how we split the hairs. The, the split hair for A.J. Brown is that he has Devonta Smith and Dallas Goddard, and frankly, a run game that could also dominate the Giants, Arizona, and Seattle. Seattle has been awful against running backs the last month. They've been atrocious. So part of it is like, yeah, he could take advantage of the air, but the other part is like, DeAndre Swift could have himself an absolute heyday the last four weeks of the season. <laughs> yes. I left him speechless. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think there's anything else I can really add. Like it's an elite weapon in an elite offense. Yeah. Simple as that. And this is what we talked about it. Like, I know we talked about the running backs being harder to rank than the wide receivers. And I think why it was more difficult to rank the running backs is because there seemed like a lot of legit, you know, top eight options, top seven options, but the wide receivers, it feels like, again, you get the solid seven, 
they're set in stone. But then, you know, running backs like 6 through 12 could be in any order. And really, running backs like 11 through 18 could be in any order. Because there's a lot of just strong contenders there. Versus the wide receivers, it's like everybody has something you can like. And everybody has something you can really dislike as well. No, like it feels like the running backs had like four to a group, four to a tier almost. Right. These wide receivers, it feels like, you know, the first five, the top five, top six, we could argue, at least I will, just because that's how my rankings go, are in their own little tier. And then quite literally everybody else is in one tier. And you're just like, how am I supposed to rank Pick that? One. Right. right. That that's a hundred percent it. And that's why we're not spending a lot of times on these top tier guys. They just they just don't need to be talked about because we know they're good. We know that CD Lamb or wide receiver two rest of season is going to feast against Seattle, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Miami, Detroit, and Washington. If it's not a high scoring game, it is a mouth watering matchup for CD Lamb. He's on an insane tear. He's been the wide receiver one overall since week six. He only has two games outside of the top twelve only one game outside of the top 15 and three finishes as a top two wide receiver during that stretch. The the only question I have is should he be the wide receiver one rest of season? Because our wide receiver one should be no surprise. It's Tyreek Hill. I'll spoil that. In his playoff schedule, he gets the Jets, Dallas, and Baltimore. And you don't really love those, that Jets-Dallas matchup, but we also saw he he fared all right against the Jets. He did just fine. So, should he be one ahead of Tyreek Hill or is Tyreek Hill still number one in your mind? I think it's, I feel like it's ah, ooh, big brain. It's one a one B. Sure. Tyreek. Yes. Gets the tougher matchups. I think right. Jets, Dallas, Baltimore. Um, but in the other games that he has, I don't have the other opponents in front of me. Those weeks, he could quite literally put up like 40 in each of those games. Oh, yeah. The other games, he's probably scoring like 12, right. 13 versus CeeDee Lamb. He's going to be the more consistent. He's probably going to give you 20 something every week. So it's really like a, you know, pick your flavor kind of thing. I just like the upside with Tyree Kill. That's why he's my one. But I, I, like I said, it's a one A one B, honestly, and someone just had to go into in the two slot, and it just was CD Lamb. Right. I mean, he's still my wide receiver one. He's Cam's wide receiver one as well, and it's for the fact that yeah, Tyree Kill could give you a forty bomb on the weeks that he doesn't play the Jets or Dallas. And again, he played the Jets and he fared fine. He did. Yep. My offense is always, or my my offense. My worry is that Tua Tagovailoa just cannot run a competent offense against good NFL defenses. Uh, so that's yep. always my fear then. You know, when he faces a, a team like Dallas, a team like the Jets, even a team like Baltimore, it's just crafty and veteran. I know they've been giving up points left and right, but that's still not a defense I want to face late in the season. It's going to be vying for a playoff spot in the well, fantasy playoffs. Any, yeah. I, and not just any, you know, playoff spot in NFL, like number one seed potentially. Right. I, 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 Baltimore defense is just not one I want to face late in the season when, when they're yeah, competing for the playoffs as well. So I, I look, I don't want to add I look, i I said Tyree Kill is one. Cam, you you can do the bookmarks. You can just bookmark C Lamb and Tyree Kill together. We basically mushed them together, but yep. um there we go. We wrap out our top 15. Let's not recap. There's a <laughs> we are pre- we're I'm ashamed at least of the first three guys that we discussed on this episode because Oh, uh, I know. So, but but, I, but this is why we do this exercise, though. Yes. I think this is important. This is why we do this exercise because as we go through it, we're still. This is just proof that we are still refining our rankings, our process as we're talking about them, as we discuss with one another. There are points that we bring up and we say, "Hey, you know what? Actually, actually, good point. I actually didn't factor that in probably as much as I should have. It's not that I didn't think about it, but I was kind of like, yeah, I'm willing to overlook that, but." When you discuss it to a certain length, you you start to refine your own rankings, your own process. So mm-hmm. that's why I say like we do this as an exercise. Is it perfect? No, no. But this just it, it, it explores all the possibilities. It explores all the outcomes for these players and gives you all the pieces that you need to also take into consideration 
as you're starting these guys, you know, your matchups, because it's it's a real possibility that people have Tank Dell, Michael Pittman, Mike Evans, and Devonta Smith on their roster. And they're like, these are my four wide receivers. And I have to figure out what the crap I'm going to do with them all, right? Like there is a world where that is actually somebody's roster. So yep. we, we explore all these things and discuss all these things to hopefully give you a more holistic look on these players' rest of season. Are the rankings perfect? No. Are there flaws that we picked out mid-episode that we're like, yeah, you know what? Now that we've talked about it, we should probably bump them down a bit. Yes. But that's why we do this exercise. And that's why we like doing this for you all as well to not only provide that transparency, but to also like help you recognize like, yeah, as we're analyzing this, like we're asking a lot of the same questions you are. And we're just giving you our leaning, our thought process on it all as well. So you can bash us in the comments if you want for it. But frankly, this is all a pra- this is all an exercise. We're refining the process as we go. And honestly, when you come back to us tomorrow, we could probably have like different opinions on again. Honestly. On those eight to fifteen wide receivers. Yeah. I mean, pretty much like you guys are wrong. We're we're right. So it's just <laughs> no time. That's not kidding. that's not that that's incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> incorrect. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Well, thanks for tuning in to today's episode of the Fantasy Football Fellas podcast again if you're not subscribed to the podcast we thank you for those of you who listen to the audio podcast uh let us know where you're where we're at in your spotify rad uh a few of our buddies got a hold of us I'm like yeah top two freaking jackson kevin's number one shout out kevin uh, shout out kevin, to kevin kevin gets a shout out uh yeah if, if you got your spotify wrapped and and we're we're towards the top of your uh your your podcast list dude let us know uh we appreciate that if you're not subscribed on YouTube either, make sure you do that. Turn on that notification bell. You'll be alerted when all of our new episodes are up. Literally every single, it's multiple videos every single day at this point. It is at least two videos you're getting every single day from us. And last but not least, Tyler and I have socials as well. You can follow us on, on the Twitter machine, previous Twitter machine, the X machine, at Lucas Wentzel, Tyler underscore platform. We will see you all next week. We'll be back with two more podcast episodes as we inch closer to the fantasy playoffs. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. I'll repeat it. Until then, deuces. Deuces.